All right, welcome back to the second episode of Real Film Chronicles. Uh, we made it through one episode and we're back for the sequel. Um, so today we're going to be taking a look at a movie that I've been looking forward to for uh, quite some time now, a little film called Synchronic, which is the latest film from filmmakers Aaron Moorhead and Justin Benson. For those not in the know, Moorhead and Benson are a couple of indie filmmakers who have made a name for themselves first in, in horror with a little film called uh, Resolution, which is a fantastic little movie, a great introduction to their work. I think on the Blu-ray case it says something along the lines of puts Cabin in the Woods to shame, um, something like that. I'm a huge fan of Cabin in the Woods as well. But I would have to agree with that. Agree with that marketing little blurb. I think Resolution just edges it out. Resolution's a super inventive little movie. Great idea. Um, great acting. I think the budget was around uh, twenty grand for that movie. Um, they scraped that movie together, and they, I think they were filming on weekends with their friends whenever they could. I think that twenty k budget puts it right on par with Clerks by Kevin Smith. I believe he borrowed 20 or 30 grand on credit cards in, a, in order to get Clerks made. So you see that parallel there in terms of that indie spirit that uh, they're willing to go that extra mile and it's really a passion project. It's a, it's a, it's a project of love, right? Their follow-up to Resolution was The Endless another great movie this one they wrote directed and actually starred in this one as brothers uh which one did you see first did you start with endless or did you uh, land on resolution to begin with did it get introduced to these two guys luckily i started with resolution and i say luckily only because um the endless and resolution take place in the same universe I don't want to spoil it, but there is a little bit of a connection in the endless to explicitly um, yeah. make those two movies, um, make it explicit that those two movies are connected. And it, not to say that it spoils or, or ruins the fun, but it would be like watching Fight Club and knowing that Tyler Durden was all in <laughs> Edward Norton's head at the end. Spoilers. Yeah, which was kind of my experience. I think I ended up watching their third film, Spring, first. And I'm not sure how that uh, how I got introduced to that film. Sort of enjoying it. I think it's probably the weakest of the four they've done so far, including uh, the one we'll be talking about today, Synchronic. I would have to uh, agree. But I went back, you know, looking at their filmography, look at the endless. Oh, this sounds like a great concept. This this is good. Put that on, and then I'm reading the trivia and whatnot about endless, and I see the error of my ways. And that I really should have started with uh, Resolution uh, first. But I don't think it really took away from my enjoyment of it. But uh, I do agree no. it was kind of a bit spoilery. Uh, and we won't get into spoilers of the two films. We just definitely recommend checking them out. You just really need to watch Resolution first because it, it does transition into the Endless uh, very nicely. Yeah, for me, those two movies, Resolution and The Endless, really go hand in hand. Like that's It feels like one kind of complete movie almost. And I think... Um, the era release in the UK has them bundled together, which which makes a certain kind of sense. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, we're going to be talking about Synchronic. We're going to be going into full spoilers on this, so be warned. Uh, just as we do, I think, on every, every episode. I was just listening to the audio commentary on a portion of the movie, and I guess Nerd. they are <laughs> they are going all in on... Uh, the, like the combined universe, like Synchronic takes place in the same universe as The Endless and Resolution, oh. uh, presumably Spring as well. Oh, did they say that? They said that there was one specific scene where they mentioned a red flower, I guess. Uh, so this is, oh, uh, we're probably jumping God. ahead of ourselves a little bit, but the uh, the creator of the drug Synchronic uh, basically breaks into uh, our, our protagonist's house and talks about the origin of this and saying synchronic, the drug is derived from this flower in the southern region of the U.S. Uh, and they, that is a specific call out to the region in the Endless. Where he was in, in the Endless, where that dude is smoking that, uh, that red flower. I think so, yeah. Yeah, that is really cool. So we got a whole new cinematic universe to look forward to here, I think. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> I love these guys even more now. Yeah, these guys, 
I'm so happy for their success. Um, I think they're going to be um, working on the new Moon Knight uh, series for the MCU. Um, they have some really good ideas. And we've seen some of these good ideas. Like these are high concept films, each each one of them, basically. Yeah, great films and just all around from what I've seen of them and what I've heard of them, just all around great guys. There's one of the few people like they've actually I think I put out a review of Resolution on the Real Film Chronicles website and uh, posted that on Twitter and um, they actually liked it. So they are, yes. are actually reading online. I remember I remember last year when they were encouraging people to um, stay home and not go to movie theaters even though it's literally um, their bread and butter. And I think Synchronic was meant to drop um, for the mass audiences last year. I think it came out at the film festival circuit um, in 2019. That's right. It was originally meant to come out last year, and then it didn't dr- end up dropping because of that uh, whole pesky global pandemic thing until uh, <laughs> January 2021. But just they seem like really decent really nice guys um, and really talented filmmakers both in front of and behind the camera for sure they like a definitely a big positive for for Hollywood and the indie movie scene before jumping into this movie did you know anything about the overall plot or concept or did you just look at who directed it and said I'm watching this regardless go in as spoiler free as possible um mostly column B I'm a pretty loyal fan once you do something that i love or make some kind of content that i love i'm usually it's usually pretty hard to get rid of me i will be usually a fan for life (laughs) um you know see as example uh star wars i'm sitting surrounded by uh various star wars memorabilia right now i'm gonna watch anything these guys are gonna put out regardless but i'm also a sucker for a great uh time travel film anything to do with time travel. I love sci-fi in general, but there's something about time travel specifically. Mm -hmm. Um, It gets me every time I will, I will be there a hundred percent of the time, better or worse, richer or poorer. I will watch your time travel film. Without a doubt. I mean, part of the fun of, of these time travel films is just seeing the various interpretations of how time travel is going to work, how they implement it here. And then the discussions, I mean, it just spurs endless discussions on, how plausible is this form of time travel, right? Well, the great thing about time travel films is it's such a, a great hypothetical that spurs these kind of philosophical discussions about agency, about free will, about um, our place in the universe, about the um, the way we interact with each other and ourselves and how we derive meaning from life. I don't know, do you want to go over Like, What are some of your favorite time travel films? Man, obviously, I mean, the first one that comes to mind is just going to be Back to the Future. I think obviously. if it's right, it's like it's almost too obvious of a choice, but it does go back to our childhood. It's probably one of our first exposures to uh, time travel films in popular media, having grown up in the 80s. But it's like uh, Back to the Future is like the Tom Hanks of movies. Everybody loves it, right? Without There's a, a doubt, reason yeah. it's it's so beloved. The whole trilogy is so beloved. It's because it's... It's a great set of films. And um, I was thinking about this question before where maybe I would throw out Donnie Darko as well. Um, another classic cult indie film. Absolutely. Uh, there Coming some to 4K really... in April. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, you reserved your copy already, I assume. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, there's some nice time travel elements to that. Um, what, what other films would, would stand at the top of your list for time travel? Oh, I've been thinking about this a lot, actually. So this one I did prepare, not on paper. I'll try to go by memory, but obviously Terminator 1 and Terminator 2. Oh, of course. Yes, of course. Of course. Right? 12 Monkeys. Yes. Perfect. Um, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. Oh, I, you know, I I would not have thought about that one, but that was a, one of my, especially as a kid, one of my favorite Star Trek films. Absolutely. Uh, one of my favorite films of all time, um, Primer. Primer for sure. Another one that's coming out on Blu-ray, finally. When was the last time you watched Primer? Uh, It's been a couple years. Um, I need to watch it again. I'm going to watch it again this year when it comes in, um, in a couple months. I was waiting, once I heard that it was going to release, I was going to watch it again in December, and then I was like, oh no, I'll wait for the the high-def version. It's probably been a, a 
a hot decade since I've seen that movie, but I do remember I really enjoyed it because it, it seemed to have this practical, like almost industrial, like true to its indie roots, like homegrown time travel, right? Uh, just a very raw interpretation of it that um, was really executed perfectly. Well, again, another um, independent filmmaker, Shane Carruth, who unfortunately turned out to be um, something of a of a jerk in real life. Yep. Um, using the jerk term here mildly, he was um, apparently, won't get into it, but he has a restraining order against him from his ex-girlfriend, which uh, says enough. Yeah, another favorite film of mine is Predestination. Um, people should definitely check this out. Great film starring Ethan Hawke and Sarah Snook. Um, she should be in way more stuff if she isn't already. I don't think she's I don't think she's as household a name as she should be, but she did a phenomenal job. I don't want to say anything about the movie because it spoils it, but it's a it's a really really mm-hmm. cool little um, time travel flick that a lot of people may not have heard about. Uh, recently, I watched Looper. Oh, Looper, yes. Right, <laughs> which was which was a lot of fun, and I revisited that. Uh, it was just really, I think Looper also is this great example of time travel sci-fi films that have this beautiful concept that might fall a little bit flat at the end. Are you saying that Looper falls flat at the end? Is this the blasphemy that I'm hearing? I'm not. I'm not even sure. Honestly, it was my first impression of it. Rewatching it as just like the the movie takes such a, a change of tone and it just slows right down afterwards. And I think that's the issue with a lot of time travel films where we get hit early and for probably like thirty forty five minutes, the concept of it we might get examples of the time travel and then it's time to focus on the overall plot, right? Well, I think that's the way time travel is best used, is to set up the situation and then kind of put it back to its side. And that's why something like Terminator and Terminator 2, I mean, they, we start off with time travel, but they turn into really engaging action films. And I would say maybe Terminator, the first one being maybe more so of a horror movie, at least for my own psyche. Well, the first one was definitely, it was a slasher film, right? And time yeah. travel was literally just used to set up the slasher scenario. And the second one was an action film. Time travel was literally used to set up the action scenario. This may be cheating a little bit, but Interstellar, yeah. there are some time travel elements involved. And then really, though, for Christopher Nolan, who's so concerned and so obsessed with the concept of time, I think Tenet was his first real true time mm-hmm. travel story. Which is mind blowing when you think about it, because he loves time travel. He loves time in general. Yeah, exactly. I, and I like Nolan's angle where okay, he's not going to just do a, a time travel film. He's going to do movies about time. Uh, obviously, like mm-hmm. you just said, Ted, it really the first about time travel, and then you have something like Inception, where it's kind of our perception of time that that is being played with. Um, and then Interstellar, of course, it just goes off the rails in, in true 2001 fashion uh, with its with its possible time travel. Uh, but yeah, there's there's someone who's doing really good stuff, manipulating time within movies. There are also, uh, just looking at my shelf right now, there's also Frequency, which is time communication, maybe. Um, then there's another little movie called Synchronicity. Not to be confused with Synchronic. It's a little indie film as well. Okay. Um, I don't want to, you know, alienate anybody out there, but it's not that great a film. I think its biggest <laughs> saving grace is that it has uh, a little actor called Michael Ironside in there. Oh, perfect. Michael Ironside. Did you, you saw so, Michael Ironside at one point, right? <laughs> I think I spotted him in the <laughs> wild one time at an en route um, between uh, Toronto and North Bay. That's fantastic. He was just there getting his food, and uh, I was either too scared or too worried about interrupting somebody in the middle of their meal to go That's over fair. and just say hi. Because I think, I don't know, the whole celebrity thing is a really weird kind of situation where if I did see somebody, I don't think I would go say hi because I feel like I'd be imposing on them, right? Like, I think mm-hmm. you saw James Cromwell actually up in North Bay, right, at a restaurant. I did, yes. Um, I was eating at a downtown restaurant with my sister, and in the booth behind us, we could hear people sort of going up to him a little bit, and I finally got up very covertly, 
I got up from my chair. I went to the washroom. I knew it was on the way back and be able to see who it is. I confirmed it was James Cromwell. My head was probably about a foot from the back of his head. Uh, and I, I 100% did not want to interrupt him with anything. Uh, although the urge to get like an autograph or something might be there. But this is just a, these are just regular people enjoying a meal here and there. Uh, they're just doing their thing. And I don't feel like I'm worthy enough to impose uh, my time to interrupt whatever they're doing. The only one I really kick myself over, I haven't seen a lot of celebrities up close, but um, at one point, uh, you and I were both living in North Bay. I don't know if you were there at the time, but uh, kids in the hall, they came up to film their special D- Death Comes to Town. Yep. And uh, my wife, I guess, was talking to a friend on the phone, and they said, hey, we just saw Dave Foley at this... Um, <laughs> grocery store like literally a two minute walk from our house and i was like do i go downstairs run downstairs grab yeah. kids in the hall dvd <laughs> and run over there and introduce myself and get them to sign because as you know as anybody who knows me for any length of time greater than two minutes knows that i love the kids in the hall it's one of the greatest things i own it's one of my you know one of my prized possessions and for me still the best comedy sketch show of all time and so i really did I really do kind of kick myself for not uh, introducing myself to Mr. Foley. I loved him in Kids in the Hall and News Radio and everything he's done. So I I wish I would have taken the chance to disturb that man in the middle of his grocery shopping. (laughs) It's my one regret in life. Well, I guess to to bring it back to some of these time travel movies, I just want to throw one more. An obligatory Nicolas Cage mention in the movie Next. I still have not seen that. Oh my goodness. Well, what can I say about this movie that's not too spoilery? Essentially, Nicolas Cage has the ability to see his own future for like the next 60 seconds or so. So he can see into the future for 60 seconds. And the concept being that he he connects with somebody who can see, who enables him to see even further into the future. And the government is, of course, after both of these people. And it's just a, a essentially a giant chase movie with classic Nick Cage insanity that does have a bit of a neat twist at the end, but is ultimately a pretty mediocre film. But I uh, I do recommend you, you do need to check it out. You had me at Nick Cage. I literally <laughs> just watched Knowing the other night for the first time as part of that mm. ongoing project to see uh, Nick Cage movies. And that was, I was surprised at, how mediocre it was, but also um, at how surprisingly good it was at times. Yeah. Like there were some neat little twists, twists and turns in there. It didn't quite come together super well in the end, but it was a neat little idea. It did not go where I expected, and I I, I actually like the movie more for um, some of its bolder choices. Uh, so one of the things I really like about these sci-fi movies, and not necessarily just time travel. Uh, but is the big setup and how they can be bold in their payoff. They can make bold moves. There's not always plans for sequels or a shared universe. It just seems to give them a little more freedom to do what they need to do to achieve their goals of of making a compelling film. Uh, What about time loop movies like uh, Edge of Tomorrow and Groundhog Day? Both excellent films for very different reasons. Uh, I would say Palm Springs was, I think, my maybe oh, my number two yes. or three movie from last year. Uh, so definitely Groundhog Day, all those time loop movies have a fair shake at the uh, time travel uh, movie genre. Edge of Tomorrow was one of my personal favorites now I'll, I'll put on. I love that whole film, the whole concept of it. Tom Very Cruise and Emily, Yeah, Tom Cruise, Emily Blunt, the late, great. Bill Paxson is in there. He's great. And just one of the best. I love that ending. When he goes to see her, and there's just that little smile, and that it cuts to that music. <laughs> Phenomenal. I love it. Love it. Absolutely fantastic. Back to Synchronic, though. So Synchronic is... Um, I don't want to get too spoilery, again, for Resolution and The Endless. Um, but um, the idea of um, not necessarily time travel, but um, time warping or time distortion maybe would be a better... Mm-hmm. Um, way to put it but the idea of manipulating time is kind of a 
a common theme through um, Moorhead and Benson's work, um, taken to uh, a logical extreme here. They're dealing specifically with time travel, so it gets um, a bit more fleshed out in this case. But basically, the plot of this is there's a drug called Synchronic that if you take it, um, you essentially... You experience another time without actually traveling there unless um, you're a child uh, under a certain age because there's a certain part of your brain that's not developed enough. So it literally, if you're if that certain part of your brain is not developed like it isn't in teenagers and they go into detail explaining this, I'm assuming it's a it's a real thing in real life. But if you if a teenager takes this drug, they literally travel through time and then the main character um, Anthony Mackie, who, great as always, right? Most people, I think, know him from the MCU as the um, the Falcon, a.k.a. Sam Wilson, soon to be um, the next Captain America, I'm assuming. In, Possibly. In, <laughs> in the upcoming show, the, uh, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Um, but he um, is diagnosed with cancer, and it's also revealed early on that that part of his brain is not developed. So he takes the drug and he's able to go back in time. Um, and then his best friend, played by Jamie Dornan. Jamie Dornan, who you may recognize from a little film trilogy called Fifty Shades of Grey. Which is all that I'd seen him in before. He, yeah. he played the lead character there, Mr. Grey. I can't I can't remember the character. Oh, Christian Grey. Yes, of course. Fair enough. Christian Grey and Anastasia Steele. <laughs> <laughs> Just to remind you that it started off as Twilight fan fiction, the two most fan fiction-y names <laughs> for characters ever. <laughs> but that those movies were disappointingly mediocre, but I wasn't blown away by anybody's performance. But then I saw Jamie Dornan in Synchronic, and then I think the show Once Upon a Time with all the... Um, fairy tale characters. Oh yes, yeah. And it turns out this guy is a really good actor, and I was really surprised. I have to give props to Jamie Dornan. If it, the only thing you've ever seen him in is the Fifty Shades trilogy, do yourself a favor, go watch him in something else. Apparently, <laughs> he's in another movie that just came out, Kristen Wiig movie that came out. Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar. Jamie Dornan is in this movie as well, and apparently he is. Uh, as great at comedy as he is at drama, um, he apparently he has some musical number that uh, is hilarious. So I'm actually looking forward to this movie now, not just because of Kristen Wiig, who's also great, but also because of uh, Jamie Dornan. But Jamie Dornan plays a character, and his daughter takes this drug synchronic, <clears throat> disappears, and then essentially the rest of the movie is Anthony, Anthony Mackie's character... Um, trying to figure out how the time travel system works to go back in time and mm -hmm. save his best friend's daughter. So these two, uh, Anthony Mackie and J.B. Uh, Dornan, are playing paramedics in New Orleans. And New Orleans. <laughs> exactly. And they, they come across a series of pretty gruesome deaths and a lot of mystery around how these people died and the one thread linking all of these uh, scenes is the synchronic drug um at one point i think because anthony mackie's concerned for people's safety he literally starts going to stores and buying out their entire supply of synchronic whereupon he meets the actual creator of this drug synchronic who's also trying to do the same thing mm -hmm. um because he realized the actual effects that this drug could possibly have so essentially the movie works it out so um, Anthony Mackie's character um, literally has the last known supply of Synchronic in existence. So it's a bit of a ticking clock narrative as well where he's only got so many tries to go back in time. Yeah, so he has like eight or nine of these pills and he has to figure out, one, how this time travel works. And then two, he's got to figure out where Jamie's daughter has disappeared to. and the crazy thing here is how the time travel or time experience works where it's location dependent so i love that little the, twist 
there's a beautiful 20 minutes uh, montage of uh, basically Anthony Mackie discovering how the how the rules of time travel work here. So he's on his couch, he takes a pill, he travels back to the the swamps of New Orleans, and after about five or six minutes, they are transported back to the present. And he goes and stands two feet away from his couch, takes another pill, and he's trans uh, transferred back to the Ice Age. So he starts mapping out in his house where he's going to end up based on where he takes these drugs. So armed with that knowledge, he has to figure out where the daughter took her drug, presumably take the drug at the same spot, and go back in time and basically pull her out of it. And the absolute, this was kind of crushing. At one point in one of his experiments, he brings his dog back in time. And this is important the because the dog is spooked. I mean, there's a really bad situation happening in, the, in, in that time. And the dog misses the opportunity to go back because he's standing in a different spot than where they had originally traveled from. So the dog is now left in the past, which we can surmise is exactly what happened to this guy's daughter, is that she traveled away from the initial... I want to call it transportation spot. Yep. And is unable to get back because of that. Is there a structure where they have to get back within the exact amount of time? It was kind of confusing where I thought he was taking another drug, like he was taking another pill to enable himself to go back forward in time, if that makes sense. No, I think what happens is you have to be standing in that exact location or being placed in that exact location at i think it's like seven minutes yeah 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 it is seven minutes that's right so but i think if you're in the past and you do have another pill that it'll either take you it'll take you to another point in time whether it takes you back to the present that you that you came from originally or the point in time that you came from originally Mm -hmm. or not i don't think is ever shown but i think the whole point is no i think the way it works is because I think that's what happens to the daughter, <laughs> right? Where he gives her the last pill, yes. but she goes, but she goes back and sits at that exact same spot that she was yeah. at, and so it's almost like those two points in time and space are essentially linked both ways. That's exactly it. So because those points in space are linked, it doesn't space matter and time, space and time. Yes, it doesn't matter if you take the drug. Sorry, it, when you take the drug, you'll always go to those two points in time in that same space. Exactly. And then if you miss that seven-minute window, then you have to take the drug again to get back to that initial starting point. Yeah. It's it's pretty trippy, and the movie does a pretty solid job of explaining it to you. There's a scene where the creator of the drug, the character Steve, that's Anthony Mackie as Steve in the movie, he breaks into his home to basically find out why He's he's buying up all the drugs in town, and like you said earlier, they have the common goal of basically eradicating this drug from existence because of how extraordinarily dangerous it is. Through our lens, everyone who's taken it has basically died somewhat horrifically because you're going to be transported back in time to like the Ice Age. You're going to freeze to death in about seven minutes, or you're going to travel back in time to some war. You're going to be shot or stabbed or whatever. And then you're transported back in time, dead. The other one guy um, encountered pirates at one point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but essentially, yeah, you're either um, getting bitten by snakes or killed by pirates or landing in the middle of the Civil War or some or some other kind of war. It was in the U.S., so it was all, I think, yeah. location-based there. So it was the, I believe it was the Civil War. Or you're, you're you know, going crazy from these time-based, hallucinations right people acting crazy because of the visions that they're seeing that they i think at the beginning it's not it's obviously not clear that it's time travel if unless you've read the description of the movie ahead of time or synopsis Mm -hmm. ahead of time but it just looks like people having these wild really vivid hallucinations and then they they act out on them right i think the one guy who falls down the elevator shaft at the beginning was specifically not because of what was going on he wasn't killed by like a pirate sword or snake bite, but he was like wandering around the terrain and he fell down this elevator shaft as a result of his time-based hallucination, right? Which wasn't so a hallucination. That, 
so that was that's what kind of confused me i wasn't under the impression that it was a hallucination but now that you mentioned um it was like a gland in their in in our heads so it's i'm using the word hallucination but really it, it literally allows them to see different yeah. periods in time but for them they're not actually there right they're just if you're an adult and that gland has been, I think they explained it, it gets it gets calcified or it gets hardened as you grow older. Mm-hmm. So adults literally just have the visions, right? Okay. Although I'm I'm wrong though because that snake actually <laughs> bites her. Well, so this is the setup. Is the very first scene of the movie is is a couple. It just looks like an apartment or even a hotel. They take the drug and as this lady is looking around the room. It slowly morphs into a jungle, and you see trees coming out of the walls, and you see a person emerging from the wall, and it's it's honestly quite freaky. And as a viewer, you're not really sure what's going on. You just kind of assume you're taking a drug, you're hallucinating. And the guy also takes the drug, but he wanders off. Presumably, I I was under the impression he went into the elevator. About 20 minutes later in the film... Uh, Steve and Dennis, the the paramedics, show up at the scene because this guy has disappeared into the elevator shaft and fallen to his death. And as they're in the apartment or the hotel room, she's still, like, she is visibly shaken. And they, a snake, you know, slithers out from under the bed. So the snake has traveled back in time with them after the drug's effects have worn off. Right, so I think the difference is that if you're an adult taking it, you don't actually travel. It's like those two points in time kind of merge, converge. intermingle, they converge. Yeah. But if you're if that that part of your brain hasn't calcified yet or if it hasn't hardened yet, you literally travel to that point in time yeah. instead of those two instead of just experiencing that time together because you can, as I said before, interact with um, the actual elements. Right, like that guy that gets killed with the pirate sword. The pirate sword is literally stuck in the wall when he gets mm-hmm. back. So, like, you're actually interacting with it, but you're not traveling there as as the kids are. Those crazy kids and their time travel drugs. Right, so the really interesting thing here is, um, like you said, this idea of linking time and space. So, the time that you go back to is dependent on the space that you're actually occupying. It's mm-hmm. a really, really interesting take on the whole time travel narrative that I don't think I've actually seen done before. And it's really interesting even more because I think people who um, kind of, you know, like as you break down time travel movies, people point out that if you're tra- just traveling back in time, um, but not space, that the world is going to rotate. So like you'd literally travel back into a point in time mm. that where you're just like, where if you're just occupying the same space, you'd be out in literally in outer space because the planet earth is revolving around the sun. Yeah. So little things like that. But this movie is literally linking um, time to space. And so it's dependent on whatever geographic location you go to. And I don't know if it's specifically a grid. Like if you move um, two feet to your left, you'll go back a couple years and two feet to your right, you'll go forward a couple years or if it's all just kind of random or if there is some kind of pattern to it that's never fully explained or explored, because in his house, the difference of a couple feet means um, the time when I think it was Spanish conquistadors were in New mm-hmm. Orleans versus the Ice Age millions yeah. of years ago. And also that the same point will take you back to the same time, because the first time he travels back to the Ice Age, he sees a figure in the distance, and then he travels back... Uh, to that same spot, and presumably this was hours later in his own time, and that figure is now slightly closer to that spot where he just arrived at, where they're actually able to interact with one another. Yeah, he goes back in time the second time, builds that fire, and this prehistoric prehistoric human comes up to him with this spear. He was obviously out hunting, probably for woolly mammoths or saber-toothed tigers or whatever it was they hunted back then for meat, for those giant Flintstone-style ribs. And then he comes closer, and he's looking at Anthony Mackey, because he's never seen fire, presumably, right? Mm-hmm. Like he's Essentially, he's introducing fire to um, this North American tribe of uh, prehistoric humans. Yeah. But he comes and sits across from Anthony Mackey. It's almost like that uh, 
painting on the Sistine Chapel of, you know, <laughs> God reaching out, <laughs> touching Adam's finger, not not quite touching Adam's finger, right? Something, yeah, yeah, there's exactly. something very kind of poetic about it, right? Which what, what, what they're, they're... which fits their style. There's something. What I love about their style is that they they do a lot of intricate world building, but then um, Moorhead and Benson they don't hold the viewer's hand. They don't explain every little thing. Mm -hmm. They let it breathe, right? They show you this. They show you these images on the screen. They show you this interaction between the characters. And then they'll do a cutaway to the next scene without fully explaining what this is supposed to mean, leaving it up to the viewers to actually engage with the text and interpret it in their own way and have to examine it have to think about it have to research and have to come up with their own conclusions yep. about what this means and what's going on on the screen which i love i love that they don't hold your hand and tell you oh this thing here this is symbolism and this means this it's yep. like no this is like here we're, they obviously have an idea of what they want it to mean they obviously have an idea of where their that scene is going where the story is going but they won't tell you what to think or how to interpret it they'll leave it up to mm. the audience to engage with it on their own and i love that that's really um a core feature of all their all their films right and and i love their if you start watching they only have four movies out right now but you can start to see um their editing style the way they'll cut a scene the way they'll end a scene off um their tone of of acting right is a mm -hmm. very specific kind of more subdued tone um it reminds me kind of it's not quite to the same extent as like um m night Shyamalan and his earlier work like if you look at um something like unbreakable or the sixth sense where the all the actors are very subdued and very kind of um they're not over the top they're not nick caging yeah. out on us it's it's all very kind of just just muted and and realistic and that's the same kind of similar acting style that they have in their films yeah and that same kind of atmosphere, if that makes sense. Um, there's a, a similar kind of tone in their movies, but you, the dialogue and and the editing and how how the shots are framed, it's very very kind of um, Moorhead and Benson esque. Yeah, I think there's something really to be said for the grounded nature of the acting and the scenes and how they're they're shot, and it really lends itself well to the friendship. Like it, it shows us how good of friends Steve and Dennis are. And how the events of the film, uh, Dennis's daughter's disappearance, affects their friendship, but also uh, Steve's uh, terminal diagnosis there basically splits from apart to a degree because they realistically struggle with how to talk to one another about it. They don't know how to connect on a, on a basic level to really discuss their emotions, really. Um, cheating again with the audio commentary. There's the scene in which in the strip club where they're situated at a table between two mirrors pointing at each other, effectively creating like an infinite uh, yep. uh, reflection. And in the editing, they were able to afterwards crop about. So when the scene first comes up, each shot has both actors in it. So you can see them talking to each other. And after their conversation is developing and the, you can see some tension building, the camera is able to zoom in to each actor so they're no longer in the same frame. So they're talking to the reflection of their friends. And it's just this really nice touch. Well, what I like is their their scenes are typically left, um, how can I say it, open-ended, mm -hmm. maybe. Where it's not like, oh, here's the perfect witty thing to say here's a you know uh, an mcu style quip to perfectly sum up the scene it's like no these are feels like real people dealing with real emotions mm -hmm. um you know dennis jamie dornan is a family man and he has um, um an older daughter i think she's 18 um brianna who's the one who goes missing she played again shout out to the the actress here um ali ionitis i think you pronounce her name Alienitis. Sure. She does a great job. She's not in the movie a whole lot because she's, of course, she disappears. But they feel like real people and their scenes are left open ended. So it feels like kind of real life where things aren't perfectly wrapped up in a bow every time. Yeah. And you have 
you know, Steve, Anthony Mackie, he's still living the single life. He's out there partying it up, but he has this kind of, there's this hollowness inside where he's looking for meaning in his life and he, he feels he hasn't found that. And you look at Dennis, um, Jamie Dornan, who, you know, he got married. He's had um, his first um, child, Brianna, and he just had another child um, 18 years apart. And he's, he's the family man. So it's mm-hmm. these people who grew up together, who were friends, but who whose lives kind of went on these kind of diverged a little bit on in terms of their their life narrative. And they're both dealing with um, when Brianna goes missing. Um, Dennis, his relationship with his wife kind of falls apart, which feels very realistic in terms of mm-hmm. what happens in real life when children do go missing or or die, things like that. And then you have, you know, Steve, on the other hand, Anthony Mackie, who is he's looking for meaning in his life. And he he feels that he he has missed out on something that maybe Dennis has with his family. Plus. Mm-hmm. He just got this diagnosis with this terminal illness, which means he's he doesn't have he's not going to have a chance. To yeah, have he's just seen his has. entire future kind of blown up, right? Mm-hmm. And just coincidentally, they start encountering this drug at LV scenes. It gives him this drive, like this purpose that he, he was kind of missing before. Transitions well into the final drive of the film, where he sees his purpose in front of him is kind of supporting his his friends like his friend's family and bringing his daughter back and making sure that this family is complete. His family is tragically lost. And as he wanders around aimlessly in life is given extreme motive to have a purpose. Well, I think that idea of finding a purpose is really tied into overall themes of the film and overall themes of time travel films in general where um, I'm actually writing about this right now for my review of, of Synchronic. But if you look at almost invariably, every time travel film will have some kind of causality paradox involved in it, right? Mm-hmm. Where somebody from the future um, has some big event happen to them, and then they end up going back in time, and it turns out that they're the ones who caused that event to happen. And there's there's yeah. always some kind of causality loop involved and i think the reason for that is that um, it's an exploration of our sense of agency in the universe right and specifically a sense of agency in our own lives that we're able to have an impact but usually a positive impact on our own lives and the lives of other people around us which plays into the theme of course of or the the plot of course of finding Mm -hmm. Um, his friend's daughter of going back in time. It's like he he's not going to have a life of his own because he's going to die. It's, like it's a terminal illness. It's, a, it's cancer in his brain. He's going to die. But he's like, I can do this one last mm-hmm. good thing for my friend. I can bring back. I can save his daughter and, and reunite this family together. And it plays so well into that time travel, that common time travel trope of of causality, which is which is just hinted at here with a couple of scenes. Yeah. But still, it's that idea of being able to travel back to the past means that you either influence your own loop or create multiple um, branching dimensions. But it's always you have a sense of power. You have a sense of agency. You can affect the outcome of events. And usually it's shown to be in a positive way. Right, mm-hmm. so then that's that's very important, not for just for this film, but for time travel films in general. It's about that sense of agency. Uh, is it a fate versus destiny situation where, if time travel exists, everything that's happened is going to happen regardless of anything you do? If you go back in the past, can you actually influence the future? Right. Well, I love that too. There's always that's another common trope in time travel films right a common theme that they often discuss there's this idea of um you know fate versus free will and i think the best explanation i've ever heard actually came from tenet right where at the end where they're discussing the events of what's going on and the, and the philosophy and of you know what it means to know the future or to mm-hmm. know that it's all predestined and they liken it to they liken that force to a physical force of nature, right? Like gravity or some other force that's acting on us. That's beyond our control. Like if you drop 
a penny off the side of a building, you know it's going to fall, mm-hmm. right? But you still, you know that gravity is a thing. You know that if you, you know, if you are on the top of your roof repairing it and you slip and fall, you're you're always going to fall down. You're never going to fall up. It's a foregone conclusion, yeah. But you still live your life, right? Mm-hmm. You still go up and repair your roof. You still move forward. So the same thing, even if you know that something's, if it's predestined to happen, it's like, in a sense, that idea of predestination is us dealing with our own mortality, right? In a sense, we're all, our gu- our lives are guided by a predetermined narrative. We're all going to die at some point. Yes, Brian, you're going to die. Don't say that, please. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't tell me that. <laughs> Sorry, his, his birthday's coming up, the big 4-0 here, so... But yes, one day you will die. I'm going to have my own existential crisis soon. (laughs) Right online. You heard it here first, folks. But there's this idea of even if you know something is definitely going to happen for sure, it's not necessarily what you're doing, but how you're doing it, right? Mm, It's valid. It's it's how you approach it, right? Are you going to approach it with a sense of dread? Are you going to, you know, be unhappy the rest of your life? Or are you going to... Um, embrace that and do your best anyway. Try your best regardless of the outside forces that you have no control over anyway. So be the best person you can be. Try your best. Very well said. Yeah. That's the whole thing. I I love that whole... I'm I'm paraphrasing, obviously. Tenet, they said it much better and Christopher Nolan said it much (laughs) better. But essentially, it's it's that same kind of thing where if, if there is fate, if there is predetermination, it's a natural force like any other natural force. You know, and look at, you know, gravity exists, but we can still fly a plane, right? You can still kind of not overcome it to a degree, but you can, you can work with it. You can work alongside that force in harmony, or you can try and fight against it, right? And I think, I think that kind of plays out uh, in Synchronic as well, right? Where he gets this purpose. Maybe he was always fated to um, find his friend's daughter, right? Maybe um, Steve was always fated to find Dennis's daughter, but the fact that it gives him purpose in his life, it gives him meaning in his life. That's the important thing. Not the not the fact that he finds her, that he was fated to find her. Yeah. But the fact that he embraced it and the fact that he drew meaning from his life from that. Mm-hmm. That's the important thing, I think. It was looking pretty grim for a little while, honestly. He, he had a set number of pills to try and find her and... I think they did a good job of really expounding how difficult of a task this would really be because there's a scene where he meets up with uh, her friend and say, okay, we took the drugs on this rooftop. Okay. Well now we're now we're exploring the possibility that this rooftop doesn't exist in the past. What if she fell because you're going to literally be transported back to that spot, that space you fall and you're just done. Kind of like that guy, in the elevator earlier in the film and even to, to his own experience he ends up in a tree he has to climb back up that tree and to that exact spot on the branch to go back forward in time in order to do this again uh, i just realized yeah he fell in that down the elevator shaft because that building didn't exist there. yeah ah, and i idiot. think there's I love this. there's some really strange element too where Maybe one of these pills, maybe one of these spots is going to take you back so far in time. There was a mountain where you you were before. Are you just now infused into the rock? But to the filmmaker's credit, they don't need to go down those paths. They just tease you enough with these concepts that you can walk away from the film exploring this type of time travel yourself. It really sparks the imagination. Well, it really felt to me kind of, Primer-esque, very much like Primer, which is a huge compliment um, to uh, Aaron Moorhead and, and Justin Benson, because that, I love Primer. Great film. This film, too, has that same kind of feel like, what if real people mm-hmm. discovered time travel, and how would that be? Not scientists, not, uh, not you know, really smart people who are specifically looking for that. What if you just kind of stumbled upon it? Yeah. Like, how would you react? How would you interpret that? How would you figure out that system and how it worked? And so I love that whole thing where he just didn't, oh, yeah. He just didn't find the pills and go like, oh, yeah, I'm going to travel back in time right. and save her now. It was a big adventure in the past. It's like, no, it's like figuring out the mechanics of how this yeah. completely new experience, yeah. completely new mode of 
of being, mode of existence, mode of traveling through existence. It didn't. It wasn't. He didn't just figure it out in five seconds. It took him the whole movie, not the whole movie, but half the movie. Yeah. Which sounds kind of boring, but it's not. It's awesome. It, it's honestly one of the most engaging parts of the. Well, I shouldn't say it's the most engaging part of the film, but it, it definitely is one of the most thrilling parts. Is seeing how the the rules break down to the point where he actually has a whiteboard showing <laughs> like <laughs> sort of reverse here. He's recording himself in these experiments, so he has a whiteboard that literally sets out the rules. It's kind of like if you're watching Fight Club and they have the rules posted in the actual Fight Club within the movie, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it all makes sense in this world because for sure you would take your phone like or your video camera, record yourself doing these experiments to show your friends and prove that this is actually happening. Definitely. It's just, it's very realistic. Yeah, I guess so. I guess between the whiteboard and uh, Dr. Exposition at the beginning, we, uh, we get a yeah. whole work through of how uh, the time travel works, but it's kind of neat. It's like, yeah, you're not just going to figure it out you got to do like trial and error. And... Yeah. I absolutely love that scene where Dr. Exposition shows up <laughs> because he shows up. He's in the, he's in the guy's closet. So he's, he's heightened the, the tension on the scene because now Steve thinks there's a burglar in his house. This guy under threat. So Steve grabs a baseball bat under threat of being beaten and kicked out of this house. He's trying to explain what this drug is doing. So we, as the audience, we're not going to get a fully faithful uh, telling of exactly what the mechanics are here. This guy is under stress. He's got to get out of here. And I love that they don't bring him back, right? They just uh -huh. give you a little bit. And I think he used the, the vinyl record to sort of show you. He's like, here's how time kind of spins. And you're at the needles in the same spot, but the record is moving, right? Um, they don't bring him along. He's not tagging along on Steve's journey. He pieces out of there. They don't have a good relationship. He's not going to be an exposition machine throughout the rest of the film. He shows up, does his thing, and disappears, leaving Steve up to his own uh, devices. No, it goes back to that uh, the filmmaking caliber that you're looking at here, where mm -hmm. it, they they give the audience just enough to to know what's going on, but not enough where you there's no mystery left or there's no yeah. Um, there's no space left for the characters or the story to explore. So throughout the uh, the film, I'm going to sort of uh, delve into the end uh, on a mechanical level here. Throughout the film, where we have these scenes where they're at an outdoor party at, at a park in the city, and there are, the characters are always centered around this rock. And there are numerous lingering scenes where the word all ways is carved into this rock. It's clearly been there for a very long time, right? So in Steve's journey to try and find Dennis's daughter, he finally figures out, he's like, okay, let's go back to this spot. This carving must be hers, right? Telling us to do this. So he gathers Dennis up. They go to the rock. Steve takes the pill. He's transported back to the Civil War. And basically finds the daughter and they're going back. And at that point they determine we only actually have one pill left. The daughter has to take this pill. She has to stay on the rock. Steve is not going to be able to make the return journey. So it's actually Steve who wrote all ways into the rock. And upon rewatching the film, there's this fantastic scene where he's in his own house looking out the window and he sees engraved in a tree like lover's initials, right? He may not know who's, who those people, who those initials belong to, but they're there. And so you sort of see the, the setup initially early on in the film without really that much more foreshadowing. It's not like a, one of these modern films that's just going to hit you in the face with that exposition. It's brilliant. Yeah, exactly. And I love how they don't actually show him carving the rock or anything it's mm -hmm. all implied right he, and he doesn't say it out loud he's like i gotta carve these words into this rock in order for time travel to work properly yeah it's no it's all it's all show don't tell right we show we're shown that rock several times establishing that that word is there mm -hmm. we're shown that that rock is a special place for the daughter brianna and we're shown that um was it steve anthony mackie knows that that's a special spot for the daughter 
and he recalls that that weird spelling of always, right, with two L's, yep. gets stuck in his head. And then at the end, he looks down. He just looks down. The camera looks down at the rock. It doesn't say anything. But yeah. it's like he knows. It's like in order for this whole thing to work, in order for her to be saved, at some point, somebody's going to have to carve that in. None yeah. of this is spoken about. But there's just a really touching scene at the end, right, where he – we. The audience knows, not because we're told, but because we're able to work it out for ourselves. Steve knows this. He knows he's going to have to complete the causality loop. Mm -hmm. He knows he's got to essentially stay back in time at possibly the worst possible time in American history for a black man to be in. Yeah. He knows he's, he's, it's not going to be a great life if he lives any length of time. He's he's dying, but he's not going to die immediately. But he just reaches out, and there's this really cool effect where he's reaching out he's half he's half through the time distortion and he reaches out and shakes dennis's hand shakes jamie dornan's hand through time again reaching out to that something very poetic about you know the past reaching out to the future and that mm -hmm. interconnectedness of the past and the future and how they influence each other right how it's all part of the same kind of tapestry staying with that kind of poetic language and then that that kind of fades away. A beautiful, beautiful ending that is all show, don't tell. Mm -hmm. Very emotional. Great musical score in there as well. Um, just an all around. The more I talk about this now, the more I'm I'm loving this movie. Um, more and more. <laughs> I, I think you put it beautifully. I, I, there's really nothing more I can say. It's so nice when a, when you encounter a film that doesn't treat you like a, like a child. Really, it's not like you said. It doesn't explain that much. You walk away from the film thinking about it. You, I almost feel smarter for having figured things out on my own, but it's really the filmmakers expertly putting those hints and clues and the, the acting every single part so that I can piece it together in my head. Because when I walk out of a movie and there was so much exposition taking place, like I don't feel like I was respected. And this movie respects the viewer. Yeah, I want to be clear. When we're talking about um, the movie not explaining things, it's not that there's a lack of explanation. Mm -hmm. It's that they're 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 building the world just enough so that you can follow along and giving you just enough information yeah. so that everything makes sense coherently, but not giving you so much that there's nothing left to discover. There's nothing left to think about for yourself, right? So there's that fine line of balance between literally not giving you enough information to go on, giving you way too much information where you don't have to think at all. Yeah. And then in that's just that sweet spot where it does enough world building, enough character building, enough story building where it gives you, you know, this great setting, great story, great characters, but doesn't hold your hand, doesn't spell everything out for you in big, bright, bold letters on a whiteboard on the screen. Yeah. Except for that one scene with the whiteboard with big, bold letters on the screen. <laughs> But done for the perfect effect at the perfect yeah. time. Yeah, just Synchronic is all around. It's a great movie. It's a great time travel movie. Um, a great entry into the um, pantheon of um, Moorhead and Benson films, who I think I'm going to have to carve a space for out on my shelf. A dedicated section? Absolutely. These guys, the more I think about it, the, their films are those kind of movies where the more mm -hmm. you think about them, just the better and better they get. And these are movies that I'm going to be... I'm going to have to go back and rewatch all these movies now again yeah. tonight. Like, I, I'm sitting here thinking, I, I need to ask you what you're going to give this as a, a film rating. And I'm worried about what my answer is going to be because after talking about it, after hearing you talk about it, I, it just keeps getting <laughs> inflated in my head. It's like, oh, originally this was maybe three and a half, four stars. And then uh, the more I think about it, the, the weeks go by and then we actually discuss it. Is this a four and a half or a five star film? Is this one of the best time travel films that we've, that we've received? Uh, so what is your rating, by the way, if you had to rate this film and you do on a scale of um, one to five? I, I'm going to I'm going to put it at um, four and a half stars. I'm uh, right now. Currently, I am in complete and total agreement. I think I rated it originally four and uh go back i'm gonna have to go back and uh bump that up to four and a half i think i, I think maybe in the future a couple rewatches i'm open to giving it a five but just considering maybe and maybe it's not fair but considering for me resolution 
was a five mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. And the endless, I think, would be four point five to five. I love Synchronic, but I think like Resolution and Endless are still I think their best films for me. But Synchronic is still is still great. It's it's a, not still, it's it's a great film regardless of those other films. It it stands on its own completely. And but now that you said it ties into the to that overall <laughs> universe, I'm like I don't know why that I love that so yeah. much. It just gives you a little more respect because that you know the film is working on yet another level that you didn't really consider before, right? It's going to reward like again. It's not super obvious how they're connected. They just one little piece of dialogue. There's probably a few other hints throughout the film, but they're so uh, tiny that it's really going to reward uh, rewatches and uh, the really eagle-eyed uh, viewers, right? So yeah, so we definitely recommend seeing this film on any format possible. It's currently available for streaming. Um, you can get the Blu-ray at any of your fine online local retailers. <laughs> um, whatever mode you used, just don't do it illegally. Give these guys; these are the guys who need your financial support. Go watch That's this right. movie legally. And I would definitely recommend starting at the beginning of their filmography. Go watch Resolution. Go watch The Endless. Watch Spring, watch this film. I really experienced the whole thing. You can watch all four of their films probably in about the same time frame as the extended edition of Fellowship of the Ring. (laughs) Both great experiences for different reasons. So that brings us to the conclusion of the second episode of The Real Film Chronicles. It's been a blast. Uh, Where can we find you, Nathan, online? You can find me on Twitter at uh, Feed the Voices, um, a.k.a. Kale Morrison. You can also find me at the Real Film Chronicles website um, and also at my own little side project, uh, feedthevoices.com, where I also explore movies just in a more uh, long-winded, long-form way. I'm still waiting for the Real Film Chronicles media empire to, to buy me out. Uh, but until then, it's my own, little, my own little independent voice side project. We'll have to consider that. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm Rybone. You can find me on Twitter at Rybone. You can find me pretty much everywhere at Rybone. Real Film Chronicles is on Twitter as well. It is at the RF Chronicles. And of course, find us at realfilmchronicles.com. All right. Well, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Real Film Chronicles podcast. We really appreciate you being here. Uh, stay safe out there, and we'll see you again soon.